I'm Christina May, the online pastor at World Harvest Church in Enid, Oklahoma. You're about to hear a spirit-filled message from our pastor. So grab your Bible, and if you're a coffee lover like me, grab a cup of coffee and get ready for a personal word that God has for you today. What I want to talk to you about today, there's not enough 15-minute sessions in a whole day for me to tell you all the things that God has done to save and heal and restore me. So I just picked a couple things. But I want to, uh, it's kind of like Smokey and the Bandit this morning. we got a long way to go and a short time to get there, so I'm going to get through this. But I want to, um, you know, we've got to stop allowing our pain to be our excuse, not only for bad behavior, but for not walking in the full life that God has set out for us. Revelation 12, 11 I'll try to read it off of there so you can see my face and not the top of my head all the whole, the whole service. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. And what I felt like the Holy Spirit was telling me is that when, you're, when you allow the pain to call the shots, you're loving your life. When you allow your disappointment when you allow your discouragement or all those things that we all battle in our head to keep you from being restored or from moving on, you're loving your life. We overcome by the blood of the lamb, check mark, that's already been done, and the word of our testimony. So I'm going to do a little overcoming today, if that's okay. And I love in the message translation, it um, says, the bold word of our witness. I love being a mouthy girl. I am a mouthy girl, and I like to talk a lot. And so I'm getting okay with the fact that I might just be one of the mouthpieces in the body of Christ. I'm okay with that. I went to college um, later in life because my wonderful husband and I were raising four short people for a very long time. And I went to be a better writer and uh, a better speaker. And one of the consistent pieces of advice that I was given was to write and speak about the things that you know. Well, I know how to make excuses. But if I asked everyone in this room if they had ever experienced trauma or heartbreak or devastation... I'm pretty confident that everybody, every hand would go up. Am I in the right room this morning? Have we all experienced some junk? On August 7 in 2004, my mother passed away from a drug overdose. It was accidental. She had battled a long, long addiction to prescription pain medication, and she took too much methadone, and she died. And the last conversation that I had with her, I was extremely hateful. And that's the way it ended. Um, I did not have an easy childhood, so all my bad behavior up until that point was blamed on that fact. And then every wrong behavior and poor choice after that was either blamed on my mom's dead or I was a jerk to my mom before she died. And you know, people will let you do this. They excuse you and they even cater to you and they enable you to stay in this horrible cycle because they love you and they don't know what to say. The Bible tells us in Matthew 7, 7, that when we seek for something, we find it. And I don't think that this is just the good things. You know, if you're looking for something bad, we all know those negative Nancys. And if your name is Nancy, I apologize. Just (laughs) sorry about that. But it just seems like they find something bad in everything. If you're going to look for bad stuff, you're going to find it. And I was constantly looking for reasons to blame my shortcomings, my poor choices, and my bad behavior, and I always found one, always. My excuses would hop back and forth from, my mom's dead, I was mean to my mom, I had a rough childhood, and people, um, they let it slide because I was grieving. But I wasn't just grieving in that situation. I feel like I was grieving the Holy Spirit because I was rejecting the, res- the restoration. Um, my pain needed a banner. My actions needed a good, solid motive. And my sin needed an excuse. Since this is a family show, I'm not going to go into the whole childhood tour. But there was sexual abuse. There was childhood trauma. that was raised without a father because I was the product of a marital affair. Um, 
I had an alcoholic mother, I, teen pregnancy, poverty, high school dropout with a ninth grade education, the death of an immediate family member, a generational stronghold of addicted behavior, and the hits just kept coming and coming and coming. And those are all my excuses. Don't you feel sorry for me? I got so tired of living that way. I got tired of letting the bad things in my life dictate the direction that I was going in. I no longer wanted to let pain be in charge. So about five years ago, I just went and I said, God, I'm just laying it on the line. Jesus, here is my life. It is a big old hot mess. It's broken. It's rejected. It's ridiculous sometimes. But here it is. Here's my life. I've done everything that I can think of to mess it up, and I'm just tired. If you can use it, you can have it, Lord. I don't want to live without purpose. I don't want to live without being restored. And I don't want to be in charge anymore, and I don't want my life to be useless. So if you can do something with this, here it is. And good luck with all of that. I've been saved for 38 years. <laughs> But only about the last five have I really been down to business. You know, I've been open with God, telling him things he already knew. And open with my brothers and sisters in Christ, or pretty much anybody who would listen, because I like to tell a good story about what I've gone through, and it's allowed me to connect with people. It's brought restoration in my life. You know, if you are taking care of God's business, he will take care of your business. Is it perfect? Hardly. Is it easy? Not all the time. Is it effective? You better believe it is. And I forget about that Da Vinci's thing. I have friends and family that don't go that showed up here today, and I didn't even tell them they were going to get something from Da Vinci's for coming. So that's kind of a cool thing. I forget to use that as a bargaining tool. But it is effective when you open up and you don't let the pain be in charge and you don't let the, the struggle rule and you just push it down or push it out or whatever you got to do, God will use it. He will definitely use it. 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, verse 12 through 16. Dear brothers and sisters, make sure that you show your deep appreciation for those who cherish you and diligently work as ministers among you. For they are your leaders who care for you. They teach you and they stand before the Lord on your behalf. They value you with great love because of their service to you. Let peace reign among yourselves. We appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, to instruct those who are not in their place of battle. Be skilled at gently encouraging those who feel themselves inadequate. Be faithful to stand your ground. Help the weak to stand again. Be quick to demonstrate patience with everyone. Resist revenge and make sure that no one pays back evil stuff for evil stuff. Be always, uh, but always pursue doing what is beautiful to one another and to all the unbelievers. Let joy be your continual feast. I love that verse because every time I get to a point where I don't know what to do, and some of you may be there, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to level up my commitment to God, I'm going to do stuff, I'm going to stop letting pain rule, what do I do? There it is. That verse goes on to say, in the midst of everything, giving thanks, this is God's perfect plan for your life. If you don't know what to do, there's your blueprint. That's how you build your house. That's how you, and then the things will come. The specific detailed things where you get to use your gifts. I mean, you just have no idea when you start to walk in the fullness of God. And I mean, we're not there. I'm not there. But I'm getting there. I'm farther today than I was five years ago when I decided to lay it on the line. So I'm here to ask you today, after all excuses and failures and even successes that maybe you think you, want, you won't live up to again. Because that is also a pit. After all this stuff... Are you in? Yeah. Are you in this morning? Yeah. Romans 5 verse 8 says that Christ demonstrates his own love for us, that while we were still sinners, he died for us. I'm going to tell you this morning, your story is not going to shock God. 
It's not going to turn his stomach. He knew you were a hard sell. Before you ever cried out to him, before you said sorry or even baked your first cupcake for the church bake sale, Jesus died for you before you did anything good for him. This puts us all on the same level playing field. We were all just sinners. Some of us just happen to be better at it than others. I want to tell you that every day I have the opportunity to quit, but I've made up my mind, and no matter what, after crappy decisions, after missing the mark, after feeling unworthy and unlovable, after shame and regret, after disappointments and unanswered prayer, I get back on my feet every day. I say sorry when I blow it, and I go again. Now, I was an English major in college, but I'm going to use some really bad grammar right here. Jesus Christ did not redeem me for nothing. And he did not redeem you for nothing. Step into your position, even if your knees are trembling, even if your voice is shaking. Say no to excuses. Accept the redemption, the love, and the call of God on your life. You'll just be miserable until you do. I'm the last person who deserves to be standing right here. But if God can use a donkey and a ram and a burning bush, by golly, he can use us. And that's what he does. He uses people. And it's just that simple. You are needed. Your healing and restoration isn't just for you. The world is waiting for you to reel it in and step up. They're hurting. And if all you know is Jesus loves me, you know more than somebody and you have you have a message to tell so those of you that got gifts um did anybody open theirs already raise your hand if you did okay open your present the gift and the package that you have it represents your life god has given you a gift of your life but because of free will you kind of call the shots God is offering you salvation if you don't know him. He's offering you restoration if you've stepped away from him. He's offering you healing and peace and joy and purpose. And in exchange, he wants your gift. He wants your life. Now, inside your envelope, if you've all opened it by now, there's cash in there. I bet those of you that decided not to volunteer are totally rethinking that right now. The reason that there's cash in there in your life is because I want you to understand you have value. You are valuable. Everything that you've gone through, good and bad, it's valuable. And in the hands of a faithful God, it can be made into something tremendous. When I was 14 years old, um, I became pregnant with our first son who's getting ready to turn 36 years old. And the whole time, I was a Christian and I prayed, God... Please take this baby out. I was so afraid to tell my mother, and that's just not how God works. He does not pluck us out of storms. He walks with us through them. Because if we were perfect, and if we did everything without bouncing against the walls sometimes, what on earth would we need a Savior for? You don't have to be perfect to be in ministry. You don't have to be perfect to witness to your neighbor, to love God and love people. The, there's a little sheet of paper in your gift, those of you that um, took that. And I want to read what, what this says because the whole body, we're all a bunch of flawed people banging around into each other. And just trying not to kill each other and trying not to hurt people. And we cannot ever keep letting those flaws or that pain or the rejection or shame, regret, anything. We can't let that keep us from um, walking in the fullness of God. So I want to run through this list real quick. In the Bible, all of the stories that we've all heard, they were all flawed individuals just like us. Jacob was a cheater. Peter had a temper. David had an affair. Noah got drunk. Jonah ran from God. Paul was a murderer. Gideon was insecure. Miriam was a gossip. Martha was a warrior. Thomas was a big doubter. Sarah was impatient. Elijah was moody. Moses had a stutter. Zacchaeus was short. Abraham was old. Lazarus was dead. And God still used him. The woman at the well had been married five times and she was living with fella number six. 
and she still made it into the best-selling book the world has ever seen. Thank you. I, I hope this speaks to you and motivates you. God is not looking for perfection. He's looking for availability. Literally, for heaven's sake, stop making excuses and let your light shine. This altar is, there's a, a prayer team at this church that um, they don't just show up and pray on a whim. They are prayed up. And if you don't know Christ as your Savior, you should meet him today. And if you have stepped away from him, you can step back in and let him restore you. So this prayer team that's going to come up here at the end of the service, they're here for you. Even if you don't want to walk up front, who cares anyway? When you get alone, you have a conversation with God. This is a good life. This is a great life. There's peace and joy and purpose. And I just don't want you to miss it. Thank you for letting me have this time. Thanks again for listening. We hope that this message inspires, challenges, and fuels you up to take a real Jesus to a real world. If you'd like to connect with us in any way, please go to harvestenid.com slash connect. Or if you'd like to learn more about us as a church, please go and check us out at harvestenid.com. We can't wait to share another message with you next week.